This week on Q&A, Jeffrey Engel, director of Southern Methodist University's Center for Presidential History. He'll discuss his book, When the World Seemed New, George H.W. Bush and the End of the Cold War. Jeffrey Engel, if you had to describe George Herbert Walker Bush to someone who had never met him and never seen him, what would you say about him? I would say he was a gentleman. I would say he's a person who came up with traditional American values, but also values of being part of the elite. When we think about the term noblesse oblige, that really describes George Bush. He's a person who was born well off had the best education, had the best of of training, and yet spent his entire life trying to work in public service to to give more back and and really was was just a a gentleman of the kind that we really don't see much anymore in American politics. Where did it start for him? You know, it started with his mother. Um, His mother was a person who constantly told him that, you know, your responsibility as a person to the manner born was to give back. And in fact, she always stressed that the team was more important than the individual, which was, of course, very important for Bush, who was really into athletics uh, throughout his life, played baseball in college. And no matter how many times he would say, Mom, here's how I did, she would say, yes, but how'd the team do? And I think that really infused in him a a sense of, of the broader success being more important than the individual. His dad was born in Columbus, Ohio. How did he get to the Northeast? And where, yeah. did, where, did, where was he born and where did he grow up? Well, he, he was from Ohio. He's from a, a manufacturing family, but then he made the important switch into banking. And in fact, both George H.W. Bush's parents come from really well-established, well-esteemed uh, lineages, and he grew up essentially in the center of New York and in Connecticut and in Maine, as for vacation time, but really in the New York financial orbit. He worked for Brown Brothers Harriman, and really the central uh, financial institution, if you will, for American foreign policy in particular. Where did he go to school? Uh, George Bush went to um, private school uh, for, for his high school, but then more importantly, uh, went to Yale uh, after he came back from college. So to jump back to the high school for a second, he of course spent a few years in the middle, crucial years for his life, in World War II in the, in the South Pacific. And in fact, upon graduation, he and his friends all rushed to register, all rushed before they got drafted, all rushed to volunteer, despite the fact that George Bush's parents and even the graduation speaker, who is none other than the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, by the way, close family friend of the Bushes, encouraged Bush and those like him to go to college, spend a year or two getting a little bit more seasoning. The expectation was that these type of people would become officers, and a good officer would have a little bit more understanding of the world. Uh, Bush and his comrades had no interest in that. The war, the United States had just been attacked a few months before, and they wanted to, to get into the fight before it was over, ironically not realizing quite how long it would go. How old was he when he enlisted, and was he an enlisted man or an officer? No, he was 18, uh, and he actually, here's a good place where his family connections pay off. Um, Having been unable to essentially keep him from enlisting, enlisting in the Navy, uh, his family was nonetheless able to get him a really coveted spot as a naval aviator. In fact, he ultimately becomes one of the youngest naval aviators in the entire Pacific theater. In fact, we used to say that he was the youngest naval aviator in the Pacific theater until one other gentleman who was a week younger showed up. Um, So now we just have to say one of. But either way, remarkably young for having that sort of responsibility. He spends several years uh, in training and then ultimately gets sent off to fly torpedo and bombers off of an escort carrier and also... You know, as an officer, uh, take care of the men under his command. And it's r- remarkable to think that at this point, he's only 19, 20 years old. When you interviewed him, did he talk about this? No, you know, he talked about, as near as I can tell, everything else. Every other question I ever asked him. Uh, he was very forthright, uh, had wonderful, multiple conversations, more interviews than I can remember. But when I asked him about this particular moment, and I was really curious about you know, what his experience were. In fact, we were on a plane together, and I thought this is a perfect moment to ask about his World War II experience. Um, he turned to me and, and handed me a cookie. Uh, it was actually a double stuffed Oreo, I remember very clearly, and said, what else you got? The idea being, I'm not talking about this with somebody one-third my age. You know, that this is just off, off topic. Why? You know, it was a searing ev- a lifetime event for him, in particular the fact that he was shot down on September 2nd of 1944. 
He and his crew were on a bombing mission over the island of Chichijima. They were trying to take out a radio tower that they had attacked the day before, but unsuccessfully. And his plane was hit by enemy flak. And Bush was able to hold the bomber aloft and keep it on track for the bombing run. And then after dropping the bombs, moved out to sea and tried and told his crewmen, now time to bail out, time to go, hit the silk. And then he himself jumped out, actually hit his head on the tail uh, as it came by. And he parachuted down and realized as he was in the water, all alone on the Pacific Ocean, that there were no other parachutes. That he realized at that moment that he was the only one of his crew that had actually survived. And in fact, that thought haunted him uh, to this day, I'd say. He says there's not a day that goes by that he doesn't think about his two crew members under his command and why he was spared and they were not. Why didn't they survive? You know, it's it's that is largely one of those things that's impossible to answer with full certainty. Um, it's pretty clear from the evidence that we have that they were most likely killed by the animal, enemy shrapnel as it, as it came in, that they were not able to get out. A few years uh, ago, Bush actually had the opportunity to go visit the island of Chichijima, um, really as part of a making amends tour. Uh, he was famous for reconciling with the Japanese, or the, his former enemy. He was learned at that point that they spotted a second parachute, which at least told him that one of his crewmen was alive long enough to have gotten out of the plane. And of course, he, in a sense, really wondered whether or not he should have kept the plane aloft longer. Should he have stayed in the cockpit longer? There's really no way to answer these questions, but nonetheless, a person who did something sacrificial was left feeling guilty the rest of his life. How was he rescued? Uh, he was in a um, in a small raft on the ocean, uh, bobbing up and down, had taken in, in a tremendous amount of seawater, was vomiting. Actually, he writes home to his parents subsequently that he was crying vociferously. You think about the adrenaline having left his body at that point. And then he noticed something particularly bad, uh, which is that his raft was beginning with the current to move towards the island. Uh, that was really not a good place for an American pilot to go. In fact, we subsequently found out Bush didn't know this at the time, but we subsequently found out that other pilots who had been shot down on that island were not only killed by the Japanese, but there was some cannibalism that went on as well from the Japanese troops there. So Bush, not knowing that, but knowing capture is not a great thing for an American at this point, paddles furiously the other direction, and ultimately an American submarine, the Finback, picks him up, and he spends the next month underwater uh, with the crew doing submarine missions until they could get back to base. When does he get out of the service? 1945. Uh, he was fully expecting to, he had rotated back, had some more training, had uh, flew 58 combat missions, had really deserved time. In fact, after he was shot down, he could have taken a break at that point, but he decided to go no instead right back to his unit to keep the fight up and not let his, his comrades down. 1945, he had just married Barbara Bush, and news comes out that the war is over. Of course, the atomic bombing of, of Hiroshima and Nagasaki brought the war to a quicker end than people were expecting. And within three months, he was out of the service and on to his next step of life, which for him was Yale. What happened at Yale? Uh, he was part of an interesting cadre of students that came in after the war because uh, there, of course, was essentially five years of students who had not been there. And many of them came back with a flurry after uh, after World War II ends, so much so that essentially the university had to build huts for them to live in. They were so packed on campus, and therefore they gave them an accelerated program of study. So he was able to graduate Yale in three years, graduated Phi Beta Kappa uh, in economics, was part of the Skull and Bones uh, society, uh, essentially the single most prestigious society that a person could be at graduating from Yale. But of course, he also was there with his wife and then ultimately with his small son, George. Uh, in fact, one of my favorite discoveries of the entire book is that uh, Barbara Bush and George and, George, uh, and both Georges actually lived in an apartment complex that was next door to the official residence for the Yale president, uh, who very kindly came over one day and asked her to stop putting out the laundry of George's diapers, dirty diapers, when he was having parties, at least. So it really gives a sense of, of you know, how a person could go within six months from the terror of World War II into the bucolic life of, of New Haven in the 40s. Prescott Bush, his father, served in the United States Senate 1952 to 1963. 
What impact did that have on his life? On George, on George Bush's life, it, it really demonstrated uh, an example, if you will, of the kind of service that his mother had been describing her entire life, but also the kind of service that his father exemplified, which was uh, service of compromise, service of negotiation. George, excuse me, Prescott Bush was no firebrand. He was what we would call today a kind of a classic Eisenhower Republican. In fact, he was one of Dwight Eisenhower's favorite golfing buddies, although one of the reasons is interesting. Eisenhower said, I like to, I like to work with Bush. I like to play with Bush because he's one of the only people that won't let me win. Uh, you know, when you're a president, you get a few mulligans. In any event, he was the kind of person that was willing to reach across the aisle. And so we really have extraordinarily little legislation that was authored by Prescott Bush, but an extraordinary wealth of tales of him going behind the scenes in back rooms, getting the two sides to come together in a way, again, that's very difficult even to conceive of today. Why did George Herbert Walker Bush move to Texas? That's where the money was. Uh, Texas was part of the adventure. So at the end of uh, 1948, having just graduated from Yale, he has the opportunity to go to New York. He has the opportunity to work in his father's investment house. And he instead decided, I need to go and you know make my life on my own, make my own fortune, make my own way. Uh, hops in a Studebaker, brand new one, uh, and drives cross country and winds up in Odessa, Texas, uh, because he had a, a friend of the family who had an oil company out there. And he began to work as a salesman for the oil company. Barbara and Little George come a little bit after. And I think this is actually a great moment for trying to understand who George Bush is on a profound level, because on the one hand, he's a person who is able to take the leap of faith to say, I'm going to try something new and not rest on the laurels of my family to succeed. On the other hand, uh, he goes out to Texas with a very large check uh, from some investors back home, friends of his father's, and he's working for a family friend. And he knows if Texas doesn't work out, there's always a job back in New York for him. So it's, in a sense, an adventure, but there's a very large net beneath him, if you will. When did you start working on this book? I started working on this book around 2006, uh, and really by accident. Um, I was teaching at Texas A&M at the Bush School of, of Government and the Policy School there, teaching international relations and security studies, and had just finished my first book, which was a study of British and American aviation export controls. Uh, and my advisor, excuse me, my advisor, my department chair came and said the question that every assistant professor hates, which is, what's your next book going to be? And he said, you know, before you get into it, why don't you go over to the library? There's a, a diary there you might find really interesting. Turned out to have been Bush's diary from the time that he was ambassador to China, de facto ambassador to China, 1974, 75. Uh, and it was gripping. It was fascinating to actually see a policymaker thinking through the issues of the day and how international relations works and how diplomacy works 20 years before he would finally put it into practice. I was immediately drawn into this period, a period that's so recent as a historian I never thought I'd find myself working on because it wound up being more and more interesting, not only Bush's sense of diplomacy, which really was, to my mind, masterful uh, when he was in the Oval Office, but also I was drawn to the end of the Cold War more broadly. I was struck time and again by the fact that we, you and I, shouldn't be here in a real sense. Uh, the Cold War and its end can best be understood as the collapse of a great power. And when great powers collapse, typically, almost invariably throughout history, great power wars ensue. And of course, we'd never run that experiment as humans with nuclear weapons in the mix. So if you were laying bets about how the Cold War would end in 1988, 1989, you get really good odds on end uh, chaotically and violently. And the fact that it did not, the happenstance and the circumstance and also the masterful diplomacy at the time to keep it from occurring just drew me into no end. He hasn't been president for 26 years. How old were you then <laughs> in 92? Uh, in 92, I, I graduated from high school in 1991. In fact, uh, I am often asked, I remember Gulf War very clearly, but I'm often asked after I talk about the fall of the Berlin Wall what I remember of it. And I have to concede that, you know, it was football season and there were cheerleaders and I really don't recall. Where did you grow up? Omaha. Where? Uh, Omaha Westside. And where did you go to college? Uh, Cornell. What did you study? 
history. I, I actually knew I wanted to be a historian from about the time I was four or five. Where'd uh, you get your PhD? University of Wisconsin. And where was your first job? Uh, first job was actually at Yale. Uh, I was a postdoctoral fellow in security studies back at Yale, actually living, uh, working, excuse me, not living, I wish it was that case, but working uh, only one house down from where George Bush had been when he was a student in, in the 1940s. How long were you at Texas A&M? We were at Texas A&M for eight years. Uh, I, after I left Yale, I went to the University of Pennsylvania and was teaching there in their international relations program. My wife is also a historian. She does colonial American history and religious history, and she was teaching at Rutgers. And Texas A&M called and said, you know, if you'd like to live in the same town, we have two jobs for you. And that was remarkably appealing. So off to College Station we went, and I have to admit, the first time I went there, uh, I knew where Texas was, obviously, but I did pull out the airline map to find exactly where College Station was. Why did you move to SMU? That was a difficult decision. We really loved uh, being at A&M, but uh, SMU was, at that point, preparing to open up the George W. Bush Library and the George W. Bush Institute, and they had decided to create a brand new institution, a brand new center to study the presidency essentially as an academic counterweight, if you will, to the political uh, think tank on campus in the Bush Institute. Uh, I don't mean to suggest these are equal in weight, but at least they wanted to have something which was purely scholarly, purely academic. So when the opportunity arose to um, create a new center from scratch, that was one, something I just had to jump at. President Bush was here in 1998 when he had his book, which was not a memoir, as you know, it was about foreign policy, and Brent Scowcroft was also here. But I want to run some video, it's not very long, about George Bush talking about the power of the Oval Office. I know we're jumping way ahead, but uh, when we see him talk about this, I want your reaction to it. It was every president, I think, uh, would, would confirm that experience. For, I'm going to tell this guy off, I'll get him, and then they go in there. And there's something about the office itself and the respect that all Americans and a lot of most foreigners have for that office where you just don't feel like bawling out the president or taking him on the way you told your colleagues you were going to do. What are you seeing there? You know, when he was in China, uh, he uh, was eventually called back in order to run the CIA something he didn't want to do because he thought, to be honest, running the CIA was a political career killer. He still had aspiration for higher office. And then he says, and I think we should take him at his word, that he remembered his father saying, if the President of the United States asks you to do something for your country, the answer is yes. Uh, that sentiment, I think, really embodies his entire sense of obligation, not to necessarily be a, a president in his own right, but to hold the presidency up as a charge to hand off to the next person. Granted, he handed it off to the next person sooner than he would have liked, but he really understood that the president embodied American honor, embodied American power, and emb em embodied American consistency in many ways. And the respect he had for that office is difficult to put into words. When did you first meet him and how often did you interview him? Well, I first met him, I guess, my first year that I was down in College Station. Um, he actually uh, used to, once I got to know him better, used to come to our classes at the Bush School quite frequently. Um, in fact, very funny story about that. Um, I used to bring him into my foreign policy class when the students had to do a simulation where they had to essentially present to the president and the National Security Council some policy issue. And of course, we never told the students that he was showing up, so it was wonderful to see the look on their faces. And we'd have him play the role of president. Uh, and at one point during a break, I had to say, I'm, uh, I had to pull him aside and say, Mr. President, I have to tell you, you're terrible at this. You're really not getting it. You're not asking penetrating hard questions. We need you to drill them. Like we know you drilled the generals or, or senators or anyone else who came into the Oval Office to get at the real truth. And he looked at me and said, you know, can you imagine what would happen if one of these students called up their mother and said, the president came to class and said, my idea was stupid. <laughs> uh, he was just such a gentle, thoughtful man and considerate at his core that he was really marvelous to work with. And, and by the time I had left uh, the Bush School, um, I had been interviewing him for five years at that point, um, many times, sometimes many times a month. And how did you interview him? And do you have records of every interview? I do have records. Um, I'm not sure that I have a computer that is capable of playing my digital records, but I'm sure if we had to, if the FBI came in, we could find a, a way to do it. It's such an old program. Uh, I audio taped everything. 
and uh, we would usually have a morning session. Uh, go down. I would drive down to Houston. We'd sit in his office for two, three hours, talk about the end of the Cold War, talk about his life, uh, and then go to lunch. Um, and I have to say, it was a really heady experience to um, go with the Secret Service to lunch with the president because you know people don't usually stand and applaud when I walk in the room. Let me. And we can do this quickly because there's so much to talk about. But I want to go through his life and the years and have you say something about that period. 67 to 71 for four years, he was a U.S. representative in the House of Representatives. The most important thing about that moment in his life, I think, is the time that he stood up to his constituents. He actually voted for the Fair Housing Act, something which was remarkably unpopular in his district back in Texas, even though he expected that this would perhaps ruin his political career. Ultimately, he went back to his district and explained his vote and explained that he had just come back from visiting American troops in Vietnam and couldn't stomach the idea that an African-American or a Hispanic-American or any other kind of American who would put their lives on the line in combat couldn't come home and buy a house. Uh, So he voted for that bill out of conscience. And I think it really demonstrated that at the end of the day, he did oftentimes see a higher purpose to service. In March of 1971, for 22 months, he was a U.N. ambassador. How did that happen? Uh, that, I think, was, if you look back, perhaps his happiest years of his life, I would, I would argue. Um, he found that he really loved uh, diplomacy. He had run for the United States Senate from Texas. He had given up his very safe House seat in order to do so. Um, was expecting to run against a relatively liberal candidate on the Democratic side. Uh, instead, found himself running against... Um, Oh, my goodness. Um, Lloyd Benson, uh, who I think one can safely say was actually more conservative than George W. Bush. We had the ironic situation where the Republican was the more liberal candidate in that election. uh, And he lost that election. But he had had in the back of his pocket again a promise from President Richard Nixon that if he did this, run for Senate. And if it didn't work out, well, the Nixon administration would take care of him. And George Bush actually went to Richard Nixon at that point and said, you know, I I think I'd really like to be Treasury Secretary, Uh, to which Nixon replied, you're not qualified. Uh, In fact, Nixon actually said something worse about him to one of his aides. He said, the Treasury Secretary has to be somebody who could someday be president. And Bush isn't it. Funny statement now. Uh, So then they found a different position for him, which was to be at the United Nations At which point, uh, it was pointed out that George Bush at that point in his life had zero diplomatic experience, and the international experience had largely come during World War II. Uh, And Bush very wisely turned that into a virtue. He explained to the White House staff under Nixon that since he didn't know anything, he would do exactly what Henry Kissinger said. And that's exactly what Henry Kissinger, the Secretary of State, wanted to hear. January 19th, 1973, he began as the chair of the Republican National Committee, there for 21 months, middle of Watergate, why did you do it? Well, again, he did it because the president asked. And if the UN experience was his happiest time of life where he discovered something that really enthralled him, that diplomatic work, the time at the RNC was arguably the worst time politically in, in his life, in his professional life. Um, he did it because President Nixon decided to shake up his cabinet after winning re-election in 1972, um, move people around for the second term and decided that Bush would be exactly the kind of person he wanted at the RNC, again, because he would be a loyal follower of the president's ideas. It became difficult, of course, as you mentioned, because of Watergate, and Bush had the unenviable job, problem, if you will, of being forced to go out on the stump every day, if you will, and defend the president, a president who he increasingly over time came to believe and then know had been lying to him. So, like other Republicans at that time, the moment they realized not so much that they had been lied to, but that they had been made to lie for Nixon, that was the moment he and others encouraged his resignation. Beginning on September 26, 1974, he went to China as the U.S. liaison for only 14 months. Who sent him there, and why did he take that job? Uh, Gerald Ford sent him there, uh, the president, of course, who comes after Nixon. Uh, Ford sent him there essentially both as a reward for the good service he had done for the Republican Party. Um, In fact, Bush had actually been talked about as perhaps being Ford's vice president. That didn't happen, but he had been such a good soldier. They wanted to give him a nice landing place, if you will. And also, to be honest, Ford wanted as many people involved in Watergate, and Bush was a public face of Watergate, though never involved in the actual conspiracy, out of uh, public view. 
Um, it's actually an amazing story how he got to China, though, because uh, everyone knew at this point that he had the diplomacy bug had gotten to him. He really wanted to continue in that vein. And President Ford offered him the chance to become a U.S. ambassador to uh, France or to Great Britain. So essentially, the two greatest plums, if you will, that a president can offer for an ambassador. Um, and Bush turned those down and said, I'd rather go to China. And I think he did so for two reasons. Uh, the first is, uh, frankly, that the ambassador to France and ambassador to London are typically supposed to enhance the embassy's social budget from their own bank account. And Bush, as he put it, still had three kids to put through college at that point. And but also because he thought that going to China would be, again, an adventure, much like going to, to Texas. It would be something that's completely brand new, something completely foreign, and something completely exotic and exciting. Um, I have to say that um, I, if there was one conversation in his life I wish I had been a fly on the wall for, it was when he came back and informed Barbara that they were going to China, something she had no idea he was even thinking of. For 357 days, he became the director of the Central Intelligence Agency. How did that come about? Uh, again, that came about uh, essentially as a long-term vestige of the difficulties of Watergate and, and Vietnam. Um, the uh, CIA was under tremendous pressure from congressional investigations at this point. And uh, Gerald Ford, again, decided to shake things up, move people around within his cabinet, and called Bush home in order to be CIA director. And again, this is something Bush thought was going to kill his political career. And, and I believe the theory that Donald Rumsfeld, who was chief of staff at that time to Gerald Ford, at least one of the reasons he thought it was good for Bush to take this job was because Bush was clearly going to be one of Rumsfeld's competitors should he want to run for the White House himself. And having Bush be tarred at that point with being a spy, something everyone thought would kill a career, was something that was an added bonus, if you will, for Rumsfeld. I can remember, <clears throat> I'm old enough to remember, back in the late 60s, there was an item and they something called the Washington Wire in the Wall Street Journal. They used to do it on Fridays. That predicted that George Bush and Don Rumsfeld would be running for president. When did he first start thinking about being president of the United States? George Bush was such a, a popular and charismatic person his entire life that he was the kind of person that people would often say, you should run for president. So he heard it his entire life. Uh, I think he began to seriously consider it in the 1970s. In fact, the first documented case I found of him explaining to people, um, essentially outside of his family, that he wanted to run for president was when he was in China, um, something that he was going to come back and do either in 76 or in, in 1980. Clearly, he was a person who always thought he should be in charge. He wasn't an alpha male in the, in the extreme. But he also, I think, thought it was probably by the 1970s a realistic proposition that he would never be the inside candidate, but that perhaps he would be able to um, come in from the outside. So when did he first run? Uh, first ran in uh, 1980. Um, actually, just to go back to his CIA days, when President Carter wins in 1976, uh, Bush actually asked him if he could stay on at the CIA. Carter wanted his own CIA director, so Bush spends the next three years essentially prepping for his run in 1980. Goes back to Houston, but really spends most of his time on the road, meeting people in all the different states. And 1980 is when he finally ran against Ronald Reagan. Uh, was ultimately the best first challenge against Reagan in the sense that Bush managed to win the Iowa caucuses. Ronald Reagan at that point had assumed he was going to steamroll to the convention. That was conventional wisdom um, and really didn't put too much time into Iowa. And Bush made a point of visiting every single county in Iowa and shaking hands there. He wins the, the Iowa caucus, and frankly, it's downhill from there once Reagan gets his full attention in the campaign, if you will. And Bush winds up being essentially the last man standing against Ronald Reagan, and in fact gives us some of our f most important historical phrases, if you will, and criticisms about Ronald Reagan. Bush, for example, is the one who comes up on the campaign trail with the term voodoo economics to describe trickle-down economics or supply side, as, as Reagan would have preferred. Um, we still use the term voodoo economics today, and we forget that it ultimately was Reagan's vice president who used that as a criticism against him when they were both going for the top job. What was their personal relationship before he was picked to, to be the vice presidential candidate with Ronald Reagan? You know, before he was picked to be vice presidential candidate, I would argue they had no relationship except for 
a somewhat antagonistic one. Um, they were not close in any way. I'm not even sure how often they had been together except on the campaign trail at different events, something that doesn't necessarily breed camaraderie when you're finally competitors. The, the 1980 convention was a weird one, uh, historically, because there began to be talk that perhaps Ronald Reagan would choose Gerald Ford to come back and be his vice president. They would essentially be co-presidents. And these negotiations got very close before both sides realized this would never work, that somebody had to be in charge ultimately. And Reagan then had to turn and find someone to be vice president, and the logical choice was the next man up, that is, the one who had been last man standing in the campaign, George Bush. And it's a testament, I think, to both men, both their sense of opportunism and also their, their basic character, that they were willing to look past the criticisms of the primary campaign to work together uh, over the next eight years. What was your reaction when you saw that Roger Ailes became a close confidant and advisor to George H.W. Bush? You know, Bush had a remarkable ability throughout his career, especially when he got into national level politics, of being able to surround himself with people who would do, frankly, the dirty work that needs to get done uh, for an election as he saw it. Um, Lee Atwater, Roger Ailes, people who would um, play politics, I don't want to say dirty might not be the right word, but play top politics as tough as possible. Okay, I'll use the word dirty. Uh, and Bush would always have a sense of remove, that he could say, I did not order that, I did not know about that plan, I didn't know about Willie Horton, for example, despite the fact that his campaign clearly knew that the Willie Horton ad was going to run, the Willie Horton being the, the famous um, racially charged uh, advertisement that the Bush campaign ran in 1988. There was always somebody around him, essentially, who could be the hitman, Ailes and and people like Atwater played that role for him. Why did you believe George Bush when he said to you he did not know about the Willie Horton ad? Because I've seen no documentation that he did, and I've seen documentation from people like uh, Atwater in particular who said we made a point of not discussing such things. Um, You know, this is not to alleviate Bush of any complicity or guilt in these situations. He was in charge. He's ultimately he is responsible for what happens with his campaign. Um, but it does give a sense of the tone that he wanted to set. That is, he told his people, we're going to go for the win. We're going to do whatever it takes to win. We're going to play dirty and, in many ways, both play the race card and try to emasculate Michael Dukakis, their their campaign opponent. Um, he wanted those things done, but he wanted somebody else to do it. As you know, many, many stories have been written over the years that when Ronald Reagan was president, that George Bush, as vice president, was not invited to the private quarters. They had no time together except for their lunches that they had. Is that a true story? And did you ask the president about that? Uh, That is a true story. And I have to admit, I'd never asked the president about that because the more interesting aspect for me would have been asking Ronald Reagan, which unfortunately I never had the chance to do. Um, George Bush was not the only person who didn't make it into the residence when Reagan was president. Essentially, no one made it into the residence when Reagan was president. Um, Ronald Reagan is, I think, of all of our presidents, perhaps the greatest personal enigma. Um, He was gregarious, but really liked to spend time by himself or at the very least with Nancy, his wife. Their typical evening was to uh, eat TV dinners, or at least on a dinner tra- TV tray, and watch old movies together, just the two of them. That was how they liked to be. So one could never get too close to Ronald Reagan. And believe me, George and Barbara Bush tried. He thought if we could make the Reagans into our friends, that would help us professionally and politically and make a nicer work environment. Um, Ronald Reagan didn't have friends in that way. He had many close acquaintances. Nobody who I think besides Nancy that we could really call a true friend. What are the chances that George Herbert Walker Bush would have been elected president if he hadn't been selected by Ronald Reagan as his vice president? You know, I've never considered that question. Um, I think he would have entered, let's presume that Reagan wins in 1984. He would have entered the 88 uh, election as you know one of a pack of people who would be running for president, and at that point, actually, as I think about it more, he would have been in pretty good stead because one of the remarkable things about the Republican primary in 1987 88 is just how far most of the candidates on that field are trying to run away from the legacy of Reagan. We think of Reagan, of course, 
through a, a, the lens of history as someone who was remarkably popular at the end, he was personally popular, but his policies were not so, especially his policies vis-a-vis -vis the Cold War. And he still had the taint of Iran-Contra as well. So most of the candidates were trying to essentially criticize Reagan's legacy. And I think given his experience in 1980, had Bush not been a member of the administration, he would have been first in line to criticize Reagan in 1988. You start your book by telling a story about George Bush and a man named Gorbachev. Here's some video from the interview in uh, 1998. When was the first time you met him? I met him when I was vice president. When, when he assumed office, the day he assumed office, I was the guy that in those days went to a lot of funerals over there. I was vice president. And um, I, I cabled back to Ronald Reagan. This man is different. Here's a f and much more open, much more frank, much less inclined to turn to his aides to tell him what to say, much less programmed. Why did you start your book with a Gorbachev story? First of all, I think uh, the book is fundamentally about the Cold War, or the end of the Cold War. And I think it's silly to think that any one person is responsible for ending the Cold War. But if you had to choose somebody who is more responsible than anyone else, it would be Mikhail Gorbachev. He is really the central catalyst that gets the entire explosion started, the, the democratic explosion. His desire to reform the Soviet Union, not to eradicate it. He was a true Soviet believer. But to reform it and revitalize it set in motion, ultimately, the democratic revolutions that brought down uh, his country's empire. And Bush's interaction with him was critical. And it was fascinating to me that Bush, this is in 1987, uh, when, when I described the, their first limousine ride, it was after their first meeting, but their first limousine ride together in Washington, D.C., Gorbachev was arguably the most famous man in the world. Uh, and uh, Bush was trying to become the most powerful man in the world but the odds were, well, not so much stacked against him, but it was it was clearly uncertain at that point if he was going to be able to get the Republican nomination. And the idea that you have this incredibly popular um, rock star of a foreign leader more embraced by the American people than their own vice president uh, was a dramatic moment for me. The diary. How much of that did you read? Um, I've read his entire diary for periods before his presidency. I haven't actually read... Uh, all but excerpts of his diary during his presidency. My understanding is that they're going to be released upon his passing. Um, the diary from his time in China is actually particularly fascinating to me, obviously because I worked on it, but also because it gives an insight into how he liked to do the diary. Um, he would dictate it, uh, and he would dictate it oftentimes at the end of the day. And to be completely honest, he would dictate it oftentimes after having a few drinks at the end of the night. Uh, so we got some really frank discussions from the president talking to himself, but really talking. Uh, and so the diary reads like him, like you're listening to him, because it's not written. It's his own words. Here he is talking about uh, his diary. How did you do your diary? I, uh, first place, I didn't do it very well. I was sporadic. And I dictate into it, not to be that I thought it would ever be transcribed verbatim, but just that I would use it as a personal reference. Unfortunately, some of these things make me sound like Dana Carvey, which perhaps I am. But nevertheless, I, uh, I, I tried to do it religiously, and then there'd be a gap. I'd forget it. But I could do it by dictating, and then subsequently it was transcribed quite a, quite a bit later. When you read it, was it on microfilm or was it the actual diary itself? At that point, actually, the audio tapes had been lost um, from the 1970s. And so all we had from the 1970s, from this time in China, were transcripts that had been done. And we have to picture this. This, is, this system is really important. Transcripts that were done of audio tapes by people back in Houston, in his office in Houston, sometimes a year or two after Bush had recorded them in China. And remember, Bush doesn't speak Chinese, and he's had a few drinks, as I mentioned, from time to time. Uh, and he's trying to describe Chinese people that he met and have it be transcribed by people who didn't speak Chinese and were just trying to imagine what he might have been trying to say. So the most fascinating and difficult part of the diary was trying to figure out exactly who was Bush talking about and who did Bush meet. I think we got most of it, but I'll, I'll tell you a really interesting and important story about that. Um, as the book was going to press, uh, we received a call from President Bush's office. Uh, Princeton University published this book. Um, we received a call from the president's office saying that the Chinese have gone to visit President Bush and Brent Scowcroft because they have some concerns about 
what I say in the book. There are some problems. There are some mistakes was actually the word they used. First of all, we have to ask how they got a copy. But the second question that's even more interesting... At what point in the process is this? Um, this is... Uh, we are before co- your book, before your book's published. Before it's published, and yeah. they had a copy of it. Yes, you know that's. Do the, you have any ideas as to how they got a copy? You know, I think it, there are copies that have been circulating around. Um, I, I don't think necessarily it was the greatest case of espionage ever. Um, you know, but President Bush didn't have a copy because one of the rules that we set out from our arrangement for the book was that he would never see the book until it was published because he couldn't have any influence in the scholarly interpretation. And by the way, he agreed to that in a heartbeat. What was fascinating to me was that the Chinese complained about the mistakes in the diary. And my first reaction as a researcher was to say, this is great. I must have misidentified people. They're going to help me get it right. Shows how naive I was. Uh, What they actually were upset about was the fact that I referred to Tiananmen Square as a crackdown or as a massacre or as a bloody event. Uh, and they wanted me to change that language. Um, for example, I suggested, would you prefer brouhaha in, instead? There was no way we were going to change the language. And in fact, that's why to this day, there's no official Chinese edition of the book because uh, the Chinese government would not allow it to be published in China with those, as they put it, mistakes involved. You can still buy bootleg copies in China, but not an official one. How many people did the Chinese government kill during Tiananmen Square? Uh, best estimates we have are about two to 3,000. Uh, there's really no way of getting a great answer on that. Um, why did they want you to, why did they think you would change the language to brouhaha or anything? Um, I, well, honestly, I think they thought we would sell out. Um, that the, uh, at that time we were negotiating. We had not gotten to a stage of sending a copy yet, but we were planning to negotiate to sell the rights around the world for this book. Um, China was going to be a big market, we thought, because the book is about China. Uh, And there was a lot of money at stake. And they thought that if they got us to change the words, that we would go ahead with publication in China, not realizing that my integrity and Princeton University Press's integrity was worth more than any money that we could make it. Did the Chinese come to you or did they go to Princeton? And what kind of people came to you from China? Uh, nobody came to me. They came to Brent Scowcroft's office, uh, Bush's national security advisor, uh, and also had, I believe, communication with President Bush's office. And the information was then transmitted to me from President Bush's office. Um, and to their credit, again, they wanted me to know what the Chinese were asking, because ultimately it was my decision as the editor whether or not we were going to change words. They, President Bush didn't have the authority to change words in my book. Uh, they wanted me to have the decision, but they also said, we, ex- we, have, we expect that you will do what you think is right. Did Brent Scrovecroft, by the way, have clients that were the Chinese at the time? Uh, I wouldn't be able to say. I, I can presume, but I wouldn't be able to say. There's so much to ask you about, and I have so little time, so I'm going to go to another major event, the fall of the wall. How much responsibility did George Bush have for that? Zero. Uh, in the sense, in the, in the immediate sense, which is to say, Bush had a tremendous responsibility for making sure that Gorbachev's reforms continued to go peacefully. That is to say, Bush walked a tightrope throughout his entire first years of his, his administration, knowing that if he pushed too hard on the Soviets, that could cause perhaps a counter revolution, a conservative revolution against Gorbachev and the other democratic revolutions in Eastern Europe. But if he was too easy on Gorbachev, well, then perhaps that too could cause a counter-revolution because then Gorbachev's opponents, and he had many, might say, well, you're clearly too close to the Americans. You must not have our interests at heart. That's the big macro influence that Bush had on the immediate evening of the fall of the wall. It was a surprise. It was actually a mistake. Uh, East German spokesmen um, read the wrong memo on television essentially giving the wrong information, giving people the impression that they had the right to cross the border. And ultimately, when tens of thousands of people saw that on TV and rushed to the gates, um, the guards there made the wise choice that they should open up rather than mow the crowd down, rather than have a Tiananmen Square. President Bush had been head of the CIA. Did the CIA not have any information that this kind of thing was going to happen? No one had any idea. It wasn't supposed to happen. Um, It was an absolute mistake. In fact, I have a wonderful memo from about two days before the wall fell from Bush's National Security Council, an internal memo, uh, 
that essentially says, and I'm paraphrasing, but essentially says, we should think about the fact that there might be a change in the border status and we should start planning how we might want to put together a committee to start thinking about how we should react. That's typical bureaucratic start to something that you expect is not going to happen for six months or a year or maybe never. Most of the people who saw the Berlin Wall fall on November 9th in 1989 had the same reaction, which was, this was something we never thought we'd see in our lifetime. Most politicians, especially in Europe, especially German ones, who would talk about a unified Germany, would talk about tearing down the division between East and West, knew that they could talk about that in the same way that they could say, and we're going to also go to Jupiter. It was easy to say because no one thought it would happen. And then suddenly it happened to everyone's surprise. Did you hear anything from the president about Mr. Gorbachev that surprised you? So... Um, one thing that was really quite interesting to me um, was more about Bush and the the idea of doing oral history, of doing interviews for history, which I'm, as a historian, both find wonderful and frustrating in many ways, because people have a marvelous ability, all people, to forget the details and the chronology and remember the end result and to push the end result back to the beginning. Essentially, how many times you've been in a conversation with somebody that says, you know what really matters? That's the end result. And the first time I started talking to President Bush about his concerns about Gorbachev in 1989, and I have boxes and boxes and boxes of memos from his administration with his handwriting on it saying, we don't know that we can trust this guy. President Bush, in retirement at that point, said to me, well, I always trusted Gorbachev. He seemed trustworthy. Um, And I think the reason was because he had come to consider by that point, 20 years later, Gorbachev is not only trustworthy, but as an actual personal friend. And in a way, once you're a friend of George Bush's, that's a category that you must have always been in. Here he is talking about his closeness to uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. How close did you get to him? Pretty darn close. Uh, Going back to your question about emotional, emotionally close. Uh, Because uh, uh, he, I remember when my last talk with him while he was in office. It was Christmas, maybe Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve. And it was, it was uh, very emotional as he said goodbye. And, and uh, I, I'm, I'm close to Gorbachev. How much have they talked since then? I can't answer for the last couple of years, to be honest. I know that they were still communicating into the early 2000s, um, but I really, you know, B- Gorbachev has... Um, be, remained a, an unpopular figure in Russia uh, and also has in some ways become more nationalistic than he used to be. And of course, um, President Bush has moved on with his retirement. Um, Iraq. We could talk about that for a couple of hours. <laughs> but what did you learn from President Bush about his decision to go in Iraq that we don't know? You know, the most important thing is twofold. Um, threefold, actually. Uh, the first is just how much Iraq was for him and those around him, not about the Middle East, but about the end of the Cold War, which is to say they understood the Berlin Wall had fallen at this time. Russia, the Soviet Union seemed to be transforming rapidly at this time. And they understood that the world had changed. And what, however the international community chose to dis, to meet the threat of violence the first time after that change would set the pattern for decades to come. That really, Iraq mattered, but ultimately what mattered more was the post-Cold War sentiment that they were trying to create and precedent that they were trying to create. Um, The second thing that was really fascinating about the Gulf War for me was that Bush was fully prepared to go to war in January of 1991 with 500,000 American troops in the region and a war plan ready to go, even if Congress on the eve of that battle had voted against giving him authorization. We have to remember, it was a remarkably close vote. Only a few votes tipped the balance. And ultimately, Bush wrote numerous times in his diary, and I have this confirmed by many people within the upper level of his administration, that even if he lost the vote, he was still going to use his authority to send American troops into combat, which he recognized would be a clearly impeachable offense. But he actually had an interesting rationale about it. First of all, he thought it was the right thing to do. He thought Saddam Hussein had to be taken out at that point. But secondly, he thought, we're going to win this war, and frankly, we're going to win this war quickly. And 
presidents who win wars quickly are very popular. And I'd just like to see Congress try to impeach me when I have a 90 percent approval rating. Um, so he thought before impeachment hearings could possibly get moving, the war would have already been over by, by several weeks. So he was willing to, to take that political risk. What did he say to you when you asked him, I'm sure you did, why he didn't go and take Saddam Hussein out in 1991 and his son ends up having to do it years later? You know, every member of the Bush administration will give you the same answer, which is also um, really borne out by the documentary evidence as well, which was that no one in 1991 in the Bush administration, including Dick Cheney, thought it was a good idea to go on to Baghdad. Uh, and the reasons they gave are really haunting for us today. They suggested that the Iraqis would treat us like a foreign occupying force. They suggested that it would create ethnic and religious tension that would potentially lead to civil war. They thought it would put tremendous strain on the uh, Israeli-Palestinian issue, which is at the center of so much of Middle East politics. And frankly, Bush recognized that if you owned Iraq, metaphorically speaking, you were responsible for it, and that that was a responsibility that the United States either shouldn't take or perhaps wouldn't even be able to be successful at, and we don't need to because our expectation is that the threat is going to be removed, that Saddam Hussein is most likely going to die from a coup from his own officers. That was really the most likely bet at that point. When was the last time you talked to him? Oh, just a few weeks ago, I guess. Just Yeah, just a few weeks ago. What was his reaction to your book? Um, I, I think he enjoyed it. Um, I had the great privilege um, of going down a couple times uh, and reading the book, uh, reading chapters of the book to him and Mrs. Bush before she, she passed, uh, and then also uh, a different time to President Bush himself uh, up in Kennebunkport. Um, it's a remarkable opportunity that very few historians ever get to read their work to their subject. Why did you do that, and why did he listen? Uh, I did it, um, first of all, because I thought it would be really cool, um, but secondly, because um, President Bush asked, uh, or his staff asked, um, because he was having difficulty with his eyes and couldn't read as much as he liked to, uh, and uh, people were reading to him daily, and they thought that this would be a book that he would want to hear and that would be a good experience, and he and I had a, a, a very positive relationship and be a chance to, to catch up. Um, I do remember saying, you know, most people have audio tapes, uh, and it was explained to me that when you're the former president of the United States, people read to you. But you're, you know, I don't want to exaggerate this, but you are critical of him in the book. Uh, yes, frequently. Um, did he blanch when you uh, when he saw that or heard that from you, or did you did you avoid reading that part? Uh, I did inadvertently read a part which I wasn't intending to, which was um, the difficulty he had over his budget deal uh, and his no new taxes pledge. Um, I had forgotten that that was part of my telling of the Gulf War story. They're contemporaneous, um, only because it's it's not. Uh, it's a moment which historians think was a bright, shining moment for Bush, but not those clearly a very difficult one at the time for him. Um, you know, he has been remarkably supportive um, in a way that I think should be an example to other people who formerly held power in that he always stated and always understood that the job of people who make history and the job of people who write history are fundamentally different and have to be separate, and that his job was to answer every question as truthfully as he could, and my job was to assess things as truthfully as I could. And I found many things in the book where I think um, he was misinformed, where I think he was mistaken, where I think he had mistakes in judgment. Overwhelmingly, i am come away extraordinarily impressed by the job he did, especially as a, as a diplomat. But even, you know, an a all-star hitter strikes out from time to time. There's a short clip of him talking about personal diplomacy. I believed, and I tried this, tried to practice this when I was vice president and long before that, that, you, that you're better, uh, you have a better chance of succeeding if you know a person, know his heartbeat, know about the family, and are, are interested in those things. Were you ever able to quali uh, quantify the number of handwritten notes or even typed that he typed out on little cards. Did you ever get a, a statistic from him on those? Oh, my goodness. Um, 
I don't know that people can count that high. And um, has anybody ever been as prolific as he was on with I don't, this? I, I can't say nobody, but certainly no president has ever been as prolific as as a letter writer, as a note writer, as a person who maintained personal contacts uh, across his entire life. Um, I'm, t- I'm, I, I understood that at its height. The Bush Christmas card list was over 25,000 people. Um, once you became a friend of George Bush's, you remained that way. And he really believed that the, the personal touch was built over time. So one of the most amazing things that we were able to get declassified and pull out of the Bush Library to write this new history were all of the phone calls, transcripts of the phone calls that President Bush had with foreign leaders around the world. Essentially, every time he picked up the phone to talk to a foreign leader, we have that transcript. What's amazing is how little talking he did. Um, He oftentimes would call people up, president of Australia, president of Zimbabwe, and say, what's going on in your world? What do you think about this situation? And just listen. And what that was useful for, first of all, was gathering information, but then subsequently, and he was very explicit about this in his memoir, when you then call someone to ask for a favor, they know it's not the first time you're calling, that you have a relationship and they know that they are interested in you as well. What impact has the Parkinson's had on him? Uh, I don't really feel comfortable describing his, his, medical, his, his medical conditions. He's... he's um, He's aging, and it's it's difficult to for anyone to, to go through that. He he has difficulty walking. Uh, he has difficulty uh, doing a lot of things he used to love. Does he talk about that at all? Not with me. I never asked. Uh, Is there anything more you want to do about the story of George Herbert Walker Bush? You know, I think the story of of um, a comparison between the Bush invasions of 1991 and of 2003 needs to be done because I think the comparison between the two is is really quite important. But I want to go back actually to something else just as a matter of of professional uh, ethics. Um, I did have a personal relationship with President Bush. President Bush treated me very well and and it was a real highlight of my career unexpectedly to to work with him. But I always maintained that I had a a distance, um, a professional distance. And one way that I tried to maintain that was whenever I was writing And I found myself saying, I wonder how the president's going to react to that word or that sentence. I would stop and push myself away from the desk and walk around and say, you cannot in any way think about him while you're writing this. You have to be thinking about what you think about him. When does the paperback come out? November 17th of 2018. Let's look at the cover again. It's When the World Seemed New. George H.W. Bush and the End of the Cold War, and our guest, Professor Jeffrey A. Engel at SMU. Thank you very much for joining us. It was great fun. Thanks a lot. Free transcripts, or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qnda.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts.